People pushing conspiracy theories about COVID-19 are scared and crying out for help. That's according to the Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of Guazulu Natal, Musa Mushabela. He's calling on society to be more compassionate towards such individuals. Mushabela joins us now for more on this and the effects of conspiracy theories. Musa, it's good to have you with us. Good evening. Good evening to you, Tabo. Now, there's been a wave of uh, misinformation and disinformation, Musa, uh, that has been sweeping uh, social media and pretty much most of the country. So we took our cameras uh, to the streets and we asked the people the question, will they be willing to take the vaccine for the virus? I want you to listen to these messages and we'll get into our conversations after that. We live in a society where, where people are, have holes in their arms Holes which prevent them from having polio, a debilitating disease, from having chickenpox, from all sorts of things. And now the scientists are saying we have miraculously come up with this vaccine in record time. People are saying, no, conspiracy, oh no, heaven forbid. Will I take the vaccine? Hell yeah. Would I recommend others take the vaccine? Yes, please do. Am I apprehensive about, you know, receiving the COVID-19 vaccine? I think I'm in two minds about it. Um, I have some concerns, but I'm also very cognizant of the fact that, A, you know, vaccines have undergone thorough scientific testing. And number two, they are our best shot at fighting um, this very dangerous, ever-evolving virus. So at, I'll, take my, I'll take my shot. That's the word on the street, how people have been responding. Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of Guazulu Natal, Musa Mashabela, with me now. So there is vaccine skepticism or hesitancy, so to speak. But on the other side of the spectrum, Musa, there is uh, misinformation, what is defined in some instances as false content that is intentionally uh, 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 or unconsciously or even mistakenly circulated. Should we draw a distinction between the two? Yeah, in fact, uh, Tabo, there's quite a number of layers in there, what, what you're saying. If you look at the respondents, and I, I actually like the clips because they kind of capture a, some sort of a spectrum. In, 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 in the way people are responding. There are people who are going to take the vaccine and they, they want it for sure. And we have to acknowledge that. And I wager that it's actually a lot of people. Then there are people who uh, are unsure, undecided, and they've got concerns and those concerns need to be addressed. And that is important. Then there are people who are skeptical really, and they, they, they are, we call them deniers. And I don't like labeling people, but it, it kind of helps. There are people who would deny this, like, does it exist? What about this? What about, and you can see the attitude is that it's, it's quite negative towards it. And that group for me is interesting because I think that they've got reasons that are not related to the vaccine that often motivate uh, those, those uh, arguments, including concerns about lockdown in the whole, mistrust of government and so forth. And so that is the third spectrum with the last uh, respondent that you included. But the, the final one really, it's the one that is uh, people who are completely against vaccines all across the board, no matter what you do, they, they don't want vaccines. And it could be because of their beliefs, religious beliefs, uh, past experiences and other things that basically make them not to want to vaccines. I think they have a right to not take the vaccine and we have to respect that as well. But it is that whole spectrum that I think Tawi, it's important to think about. And since we've been grappling with this whole thing around attitudes towards vaccine, and when we, as we dismantle or try to uh, kind of identify the different layers, we're learning more and more and more about what, what struggles people are facing. And my view is that people who are really against vaccines is a smaller proportion than people who want vaccines and those who are just undecided yeah. and can benefit from accurate information. What do we do with those, which you mentioned, that third group who truly believe that the evidence is wrong and that their feelings, their emotions, their anecdotes are more important right now in saving lives? Yeah, 
So for me, I, I see them as late adopters. I think that, uh, you know, right now their voices are strong, but we should not be distracted a lot by, by those people. For me, I, I try to extend a lot more compassion towards them because uh, when, when I listen to their arguments and when you get deeper into the conversation, you find that there's something that's happened that's made them have that negative attitude. So people have suffered a lot from COVID-19 and they have lost in terms of jobs and the economy, uh, people who are upset with the lockdown and people who feel that their rights have been violated, people who mistrust government, and there are also and people who are caught up in global politics, really, like the things that are happening in America, and they feel like they're happening here, and other other reasons that people have, and they are directing that uh, anger towards this. And some people have lost loved ones, and and they are upset, and they've got every reason to be upset. And for me, I think that um, you know, extending a lot more compassion and really kind of accommodating their feelings and validating those feelings is quite important. And I find that um, in time, those people are going to be late adopters. Um, I, some people who are pushing all these conspiracies are, the, are some of the people that are going to be first in line to want to get the vaccine when it arrives. And I feel like they, they are misleading some of these people who are actually truly hurting and, and truly affected by the pandemic and, uh, and are mistrustful of, of government. On the whole, I do think, Tabo, that, um, you know, in time, we will see that uh, as, as they see that those who are willing to adopt early, as they see those who are changing their minds, and if as they see people being okay, the pandemic coming down, they will be late adopters. They will come in later and adopt the, the vaccine. These are the late adopters, Musa, who are likely to push forward the message whenever they receive mis or disinformation. Do you think they recognize that misinformation can actually have a negative impact in our public health response? Yeah, that's a, a very, a very good question. I think that uh, th there's a few people who are intentionally being uh, objectionable. And in, in today's world, we are finding, Tabo, that people gain publicity through saying very ugly things, very negative things, very controversial things. And we give them the airtime. We, we listen to them, we, we, we basically make them famous for saying very negative things. And so it works for them. Um, but there are also people who genuinely believe the things that they're saying. And sometimes when you lack insight into something, you, you're not aware that you don't know. And, and that lack of awareness really can be problematic when you are an expert in, in another field of your life and you are respected. And now you're claiming authority over something that you don't understand, and yet you want to speak with a voice of authority over it, which is why, you know, I do have a problem when someone who is a, a famous politician or a respected business person, you know, start to make very strong statements about vaccines based on, on, on misinformation, and they influence people's perceptions. And when they do that, they are causing harm, potentially. And for me, in those instances, I actually think that uh, we need to hold people accountable. And yes, they have their own reasons, but people have to learn to appreciate the, the consequences of their actions. Because if we don't do that, then you know we are going to be detrimental. I mean, you can see, Tabo, like how uh, you know we talk about how Trump incited um, insurrection in, in 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 the U.S. and if we don't hold people accountable, that's what we are doing. We are allowing that and it will get out of control. It will disrupt our public health programs and interventions that we have to implement. Now, growing up, you and I were taught a particular way of receiving information and how that information comes to us and how we process it. And as we grow, uh, uh, we, we begin to critically uh, engage with information, therefore assess and are able to see what is true and what is not. Uh, and uh, likely our uh, younger kids, the younger generation, is also able to do that because there's just a, 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 a plethora of information available to them. But the elderly are not as, as fortunate as far as getting that information and critically analyzing it. Uh, case in point, that clip that we played, quite an elderly lady there saying, look, I, I'm not going to take this vaccine. How do we assist? Yeah, and, and I think it's because of the way we communicate. Uh, one of the things that we got really wrong um, 
in this country in terms of the pandemic, it's our communication machinery. I think that our information gets uh, to certain people and not everyone. And, uh, and I think we now communicate a lot with social media and uh, mainstream media online and so forth. But you know, um, a lot of people communicate well person to person. We, you know, when the word of mouth is really powerful for, for a lot of the people who are the, in the older generation or in the later parts of their lives. And they trust the people that are close to them that they respect and they will accept what those people say. And so I, I don't think that we have um, done enough to tap into those other mechanisms of communication. I'm not a communication expert, but from a public health point of view, public health communication has been lacking in this area. I know that nationally, uh, our, our, our minister and the president have been communicating generally. But again, you can ask, in what languages are we communicating? How is the message getting to, to the locals? And for me, communication is not just about saying things out. It's also about how people understand the things that you are saying. And it's one thing to be able to blurt out the facts, but then it's another thing to make sure that a person who's listening is able to understand. So for me, Tabo, I really think that we have to reflect carefully in about the ways in which we communicate and whether the diverse mechanisms of communication are able to cater for the diverse population that we have, as you say, across the age, across the race, across the geography, in this country, there's so much diversity and we are not reaching all the corners of this country in terms of our messages. Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Musa Moshabil, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us tonight.